All right, I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, welcome everyone to this session. Uh, my name is Paul Lemieux and I am the EDMW planning team committee member facilitator for this session. Just have a few announcements before we get started. Uh, this session is being recorded. A Google Drive link to the recording will be posted to the workshop website available after the workshop. If you are a presenter, you should have received the likeness and profile release and privacy act statement. And by turning on your camera, you are agreeing to those terms. If you do not agree, please leave your camera off. If you are presenting and you have not received the notification, please let me know and I can get that release statement for you. Attendee cameras are disabled for this session. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to the session chair, Sudhir. Thanks. All right, thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, so Tyler, do, do we wanna share our first slide? Thank you. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our the, the session on the open science and open science infrastructure leading innovation today. Thanks for taking time. You know, I know you have so many other things planned, but thanks for taking time to come and uh, hear about our discussions on the open science. We have lined up pretty, pretty uh, uh, fabulous presenters who are leading, you know, the lead on their this domain and their here. So just a quick intro for myself. I'm Sudhir Shrestha. I'm I work for the NOAA National Weather Service Office of Water Predictions. I direct. Uh, I direct the, the web and the data services program uh, out of the uh, water program. And I'd like to, uh, uh, Tyler, she is my co-chair uh, to introduce herself as well. Hi there, I'm Tyler Christensen. I'm the um, data management architect for NESDIS and um, really looking forward to this session. All right, thank you, uh, thank you, Tyler. So we have uh, uh, several uh, several presenters uh, lined up here. We have our first presenter, uh, Dr. Shell Gentman, uh, <clears throat> Shell Gentman, and uh, and then the uh, D. Carter Clarking, and then the, we have Joe Money, and the, the fourth presenter we have uh, Chris uh, Chris Martin uh, from OSTP. So uh, I'll introduce to uh, uh, quickly to the Shell. So <clears throat> uh, uh, so Dr. Shell Gentman works for NASA headquarters, and she she's a transfer to Open Science Task Force and scientist. Uh, and a lead as a physical oceanographer focused on the remote sensing shell has worked for over 25 years on retrievals of ocean temperature and the space uh, using the data and understanding how the ocean impacts our lives. So she's currently serving as a member of the NOAA Science Advisory Board as well. So just to give a little bit of background on what we're trying to get here today was, uh, you know, today we'll talk a little bit about the, you know, some of the concept of the open science, what does it mean and what does it mean just for the, for the folks like you know, trying to answer what we're trying to get out of this session, and also talk about what are the current ongoing initiatives that promotes uh, making science open, right? And then how the other federal agencies are working towards the enabling the open science, and what are the current current policies that are in place that enable that's helping us to enable the open science as well. So with that, I'll pass it to uh, Dr. Shaw. Thanks, Sudhir, and thanks everyone for joining us today. So I was going to start by talking about the New Year of Open Science. And so NASA has an open source science mission, and it's called Transform to Open Science, or TOPS. We have a group at headquarters working on it, as well as several scientists at Ames, Goddard, and we're out of the Chief Science Data Office. So when we talk about open science, we're talking about inclusive, accessible, and in inclusive, accessible, and reproducible science. We want it to be, it's not just about data, it's about fair data. It's not just about software, it's about using open software, open results, and broadening pathways and increasing pathways to science by a larger community. And next slide, please. So, why should we do open science? Why should we be looking at doing this sort of new type of science where we're open and we share knowledge? It's because we're facing these really big challenges, COVID and climate change, and we've realized that science status quo isn't really getting the participation that we need to address these big problems. And there's some big success stories with COVID 
that showed how open science really enables science with an impact and a scale that is transformative. And we need that for climate change. We need more people, more hands, more eyes, more brains with very diverse experiences to participate. We know that diverse teams have more impactful science. So we need to change what science looks like and how we're doing it in order to enable that better. We know that open science accelerates the pace of science. It increases the impact of science. It expands applications of data and science and shares hidden knowledge. And it demonst it's demonstrated to expand participation in science. So next slide, please. So, sorry, next slide. Thank you. So what we're working on at NASA is a $40 million five-year mission geared towards accelerating the adoption and understanding of open science. We have three key goals with this five-year mission. First, to have 20,000 scientists and new participants to scientists to earn open science badges and certifications. That will be, we have a basic understanding of open science, we know some of the tools, and I'll talk about what that means in the next couple of slides. We also wanna enable five major discoveries based in open science practices, and we wanna increase participation by underrepresented groups by two times. So we wanna double participation. So it's not just about doing science in a new way, it's about doing it with new people as well. And so how are we gonna do that? We have the year of open science. So next slide, please. And we're going to try and help the scientific community. It's an activation of the open science community. We know a lot of people are already engaged in doing open science, but a lot of communities are doing parts of open science. They're doing open data, but not open software or, they're publishing in closed journals, or they're not sharing software during the development process. So open science is really a continuum. There's no box to check that says, we're doing open science. There's a whole list of different activities that you can engage in that can be closed and that we can move to being more fully open. And as we move towards that spectrum, building trust in open science, you find that the community is more and more open to being fully open. And fully open science looks like free unlimited data access, documented software and algorithms, linked data and publications, open journals, with a fully transparent process. And I think that's really key is that opening up that scientific process, reproducibility across platforms, teaching culture, and holding our meetings more openly. And that's where we start to really enable the activation of open science to get to those transformative breakthroughs and impacts. Next slide, please. So to start, we really wanna recognize that there's a lot of basic skills that all scientists need to do open science, but they're rarely trained on. And this is similar to a lot of us code, but probably didn't take a coding class in college. We just picked it up along the job. So this is another one of those things that we can actually learn to make our science more impactful. So how do you do that? With TOPS, we are creating what we're calling Open Core, which is basic open science skills. It's a curriculum about open science. And we're also working to create, and so that is a discipline agnostic, general open science course that anyone can take. We're also working to create additional discipline specific advanced modules that will be available because we recognize that for a lot of existing scientists, seeing the transform transformation that open science has on your workflow and the efficiency and impact that your work can have is what's gonna motivate them to learn more about open science. So we're working to create those resources right now. Next slide, please. And this is really what we're talking about when we say a basic open science curriculum. This covers sort of all parts of open science. And the first is the ethos of open science. Like what is open science? How does it benefit me? And what, why does it benefit the greater scientific community? But also really importantly, like what are the best practices around open science and how do you start practicing it? And then the next modules are all about how to do that. It's open tools and resources. So how do you use these popular open science tools? There's been a real shift in resources in the last five years where open science 10 years ago is not open science today. We have a lot more easy to use tools that make doing your science openly very easy. And how to share your software, how to create open software, how to share it, 
uh, how to use it and how to use open data, share open data, and also about best practices for sharing all results and analysis as well as peer reviewing. And we really want to recognize that journals have been the traditional method that scientists have shared a lot of their results. And that's really changed. A lot of people are sharing, a lot of scientists and people are sharing their results through blog posts, through Twitter, and creating impact and scientific impact around those other publishing models. If you complete all five modules, you earn a certification in open science, and this will be able to be completed in person, independently, and in virtual cohorts. And again, at the end, you earn the certification. Next slide, please. So how we're going about doing that is engaging with the community. And we're creating a cohort of TOPS champions, which are scientists to help teach these modules at events and really showcase their science as open science examples. We're working to create virtual cohorts that will be able to do this open science course online at your own pace. We're funding summer schools, so institutions that will sort of run science team meetings. And this is where we want to really hold these summer schools at a non R1 minority serving institutions so that we broaden participation and get them to engage with the scientific community. So this is where we have science team meetings being held at these schools. They do the open science curriculum in the morning and science team business in the afternoon. And then their entire team gets trained together on these new open source, open science tools and how to do open science. Uh, we're looking to expand the curriculum, uh, these discipline specific modules and also fund and host hackathons. Next slide, please. So the year of open science is really about creating high level visibility, publishing articles, working it into communications, announcing new open science awards and recognize recognition of open science activities. We plan to be at about 12 or more workshops, uh, very large meetings next year, hoping to reach about 100,000 people. And this covers, this is a NASA mission, so it covers all five NASA divisions, BPS, Planetary, Helio, Earth, and Astro. And we're also targeting these historically underrepresented groups. These conferences initially in two, the year of open science target domestic meetings. We have EGU as the only exception, and they'll have TOPS representation. So booths, town halls, workshops to teach the open core curriculum. And we're working with them to create high visibility. We'll also be at other meetings and organizing other workshops. We're doing the virtual cohorts at the same time during the year of open science, and we'll be having these summer schools again during the year of open science. That'll be the kickoff and targeted workshops, especially with historically underrepresented communities. So there's a lot going on this year. We're going to be really busy, and we hope that you will join us at one of our events to start learning about open science. Next slide, please. And we're doing this because we know that open science accelerates major scientific discoveries. And this is just a couple of examples that I gathered from Twitter. I just put out a call saying like, hey, tell me about your open science examples. And I got some of these responses and they're pretty amazing. Like a really high profile example is the first image of a black hole. And they used a lot of open source tools to make that image, to do that analysis. There's also examples of AI algorithms to uh, find illegal gold mining in Africa that were then those algorithms were taken and used in the Amazon. There's all sorts of examples of how the open science tools are accelerating science. And there's a lot of results that says, this is a new way of doing science. We need the scientific community to learn about this and start doing science like this, not only because it's more impactful, but because it broadens participation. Next slide, please. And we're also really targeting broadening participation. And these are some of the specific things that we're doing. One of the most powerful things about open science is it makes the gatekeepers irrelevant because you're sharing this hidden knowledge openly. And I think a lot of us don't even realize how much of the knowledge we have is just not shared. Uh, how do you write a proposal? Often someone shares a proposal with you for the first time when you write it. 
And we know that this has a documented impact on participation and credit for underrepresented communities. So it's about changing the framework of science. So we're not just making room at the table, we're creating a new, more equitable table. We're gonna do this by creating this open core. We're targeting uh, underrepresented groups for workshops and events, holding these science team meetings at minority serving institutions and making our science team meetings open and funding participation by underrepresented communities, sharing hidden knowledge and really ensuring that there's equitable access. Next slide, please. We just released this week a $3 million per year funding opportunity. And this is about taking funding and getting the open science community engaged with creating resources with us and developing this with us. So there's three different things that we're asking for in this funding opportunity. The first is to develop Science Core, which are these science specific modules that showcase open science workflows. The next is this open core summer schools. So go to summer school, learn about open science. Uh, we're also the virtual cohorts. If you wanna find out more about this funding opportunity on October 13th, we're hosting a forum that you can register for and ask questions about this. November 10th is when the optional notice of intents are due and December 8th is when proposals are due. Uh, next slide, please. And I wanna bring this back because as Suhir mentioned, I'm also on the NOAA Science Advisory Board. And NOAA has a strategic plan, 2022 to 2026. And I took some of the text from that, which is you know, NOAA will ensure the agency's data information are broadly available on a free and open basis and easy to use. And I really wanna emphasize that easy to use because it's not just enough to put data online we actually have to make it sure that it's fair. It's findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, and provided in different formats and in different ways that people can get at it really without knowing about the format sometimes. And a lot of these open science tools, things specifically like X-Array, the Python library that makes reading net CDF files or even cloud optimized data sets that are in czar format or other formats, even GRIB, easy to use it's almost invisible what format they're in. You just get access to the data. And that's transformative for bringing new people to work on science. Uh, I will also wanna highlight that NOAA will continue to share its knowledge by keeping open its data, codes, algorithms, models, research outputs, manuscripts, publications, processes, and methods. And this gets to, again, this idea of open science. It's more than just data. It's about everything. It's about the entire scientific process from start to finish. And maybe initially you first feel comfortable sharing a data set at publication or sharing your software in an executable notebook at publication. And then hopefully in the future, you feel more comfortable actually sharing software as you're developing it and co-developing it with the community. Next slide, please. And the NOAA Science Advisory Board in December 2021, there was the priorities for weather research report that was released. And one of the recommendations in that report was for NOAA to embrace open science, to really provide uniform access to all communities, support a geographically distributed diverse workforce. This will broaden access to talent and increase agility and innovation. The Science Advisory Board is currently working through an open data, open science working group on another report that will be released in a couple months that specifically talks about open data and open science within the context of NOAA. Uh, next slide, please. And here's how we really want to, to change everything we need everyone. We need agencies, we need scientists, we need mission partners to co-develop activities with us. So we're working on a TOPS GitHub. We have a website that gives you a link to our GitHub. All of our resources are open and we're advocating for groups to create open science action plans. And the link in the slide is to the UNESCO report. There was a UNESCO draft recommendation on open science that was released about a year ago. I think December 21. And in there, there's seven areas of action. And it really applies to almost everyone, universities, scientists, agencies, how each, how each organization can create a plan to advance open science, whether it's providing cyber infrastructure, advancing open tools, or advancing open publications or data. 
Uh, we also are calling for people to participate in the open core development and to create new open science events. And a lot of these resources are coming online in the next 15 days. So we expect to have them on the GitHub site by the end of the month. And again, we'll be co-developing this with the community. So we'll be putting up version zero, which will help you understand how to participate, how to create your open science events, what resources are available, and how you can really team with TOPS to advance open science. Uh, and that's the end. So next slide, please. So we'll take questions and answers at the end, I think. Right, Sudhir? Yes, thank you, Chell. Uh, yeah, I think it's, it's really uh, valuable to see how NASA is working on towards you know, enabling the open science, right? This is, this is sort of like not a single effort. I've been somehow in, mm -hmm. uh, involved in the process in the tops, right? It takes a village to make this thing happen, right? The NASA itself can yeah. do that. There's you know, what we are doing in the NOAA as well, sort of like a, you know, a cross path at the, some of the collaborations. We'll talk about some of those, but you talked about like, you know, enabling the open science on the research and publications that directly sort of like, you know, goes to the next, our next speaker that I'm going to introduce, uh, 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 Dee Clarking. Uh, so she, she's uh, our director of the NOAA Central and the Reason Libraries. Uh, if we can get our first slide up, I think. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, so uh, D is uh, uh, the director of the NOAA Central Library located in Silver Spring, Maryland. She leads a team of dedicated librarians engaged in the research services, bibliometrics, metadata applications, and support for the open science publications. Prior to her work at NOAA, D led several public facing uh, teams at the NIH National Library of Medicines. And I know uh, by working uh, with her as well, you know, we've been involved in some of the the, the SOS events, the, the, uh, the OSTP is leading as well. She's been involved in several other efforts. So with that, I'll let uh, Dee talk about some of her um, thoughts on the open science. Oh, thank you so oh, much, Sahir. Yeah. That's that's great. And it was really exciting to listen to Shell's uh, defini good definition of open science. So I want to thank you for the opportunity to talk to you today about uh, the Central Library's efforts to support open science by building infrastructure for publications. And what I'd like to do is I don't feel like I need to give a definition of open science at this point because of uh, what we just listened to, but I'd like to show you a couple of examples of what I think of as publication silos, which might be sort of the opposite of open science practices. Uh, before we do that, though, I, I would just state that open science for publications is not to be confused with open access. Open access is a business model. And we can talk more about that you know, in just a few slides. But open science for publications is a whole suite of practices. It may include publishing on a preprint server or uh, you know, certainly linking your publication with other research outputs and making your publication as fully available as possible. So before I go on to that, just let me briefly say that if you're not familiar with the Central Library, our mission is to support and further NOAA's mission of promoting global environmental leadership. And we do this stewardship, excuse me, and leadership. <laughs> we do this by providing collections, tools, and services to support NOAA staff. Next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about publication silos and then move forward from there. And I would define a publication silo as a delivery mechanism for publications that uh, goes against the fair principles in some way. And many, and no shame or blame here, many of these are just uh, delivery, uh, old practices rather, or responses to the available technology at the time. This is a good example. The National Sea Grant Library hosted at the University of Rhode Island, 85,000 pub, uh, published PDF documents representing Sea Grant's vital and very important work, but all hidden under the search box with no machine access and uh, very limited findability. Next slide, please. So here's another kind of silo. Uh, and again, I'm not criticizing, I'm just pointing out these are, the, these are quite common you know, barriers that we see. In this case, the NOAA program really very appropriately appropriately, wants to call out public attention to its very important and fantastic science. 
Uh, and you can see the Supreme uh, print release, uh, press, excuse me, press release uh, screenshot there on the left. And the office has even uh, included a help helpful link to the paper, but unfortunately what happens when the public click on that link is that they hit a paywall over on the journal website, which is the box you, box you see on the right. Next slide, please. And here's a, another kind of silo and we'll move on from our silos after this, but and again, many, many of our programs and labs quite rightly want to provide a listing to their publications. In this case, this is our chemical sciences lab in OAR in Boulder. And you can see on the left, the tab invites you to work your way down at the bottom there, work your way down through a drop down menu of categories to view listings of publications. Now, I love that the lab has called out our, our infrastructure solution, the institutional repository. But again, if you scroll through these listings uh, that are provided and work your way through this menu structure, you'll again see over to the right that we begin to hit paywalls. And there are other obvious uh, you know, barriers to findability in this kind of approach. Next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about infrastructure solutions to solve these problems that get us closer in line to fair principles in support of open science. Next slide, please. This is the NOAA Institutional Repository, which is run out of the library. The repository was established in response to the 2013 memo from OSTP directing all agencies with $100 million and over in R&D expenses to stand up a repository to ensure that the American taxpayers have full access to the science, including publications that they fund. And I'll refer to the repository as the IR for the rest of the presentation. Now the IR is a green open access repository and that's sometimes also known as a self archiving repository where the author as a federal author and scientist or funded uh, by the federal government author has the right to take their final accepted manuscript from the publisher and deposit it in a, the green open access repository at the agency. And what to be totally clear what I'm talking about uh, is the final accepted manuscript that does not have any of the journal's typeface on it or any of their other value adds. This is the accepted manuscript that a script that the federal scientist has the right to self deposit and make available. The other good thing about the or thing that it goes more towards the open science and full findability for our agency is that the IR, IR is also a one NOAA solution. So all programs, all line offices should deposit in compliance with the NOAA PAR policy of 2015, which was our individual PAR plan that we wrote in response to that 2013 memo. The IR subsequently uh, contains the full text of not just journal articles, but all NOAA agency publications, including tech memos, tech reports, cruise reports, as you can see, biological opinions, et cetera, et cetera. You can see on the screenshot uh, what a search result would look like. And la but last, uh, not just uh, human searching, but the IR is also searchable via API. Most of its content with the exception of older documents and publishers versions that we include is also fully section 508 accessible for those using machine readers. But so let's dig a little further into this to see some of the integrations possibilities that support open science and also uh, create the possibility for unsiloing. Next slide, please. So on the left, you can see three ways to access content in the IR. Up at the top is just a straight Google search. And we know most Americans, even uh, scientists and professionals start their search either in Google or Google Scholar. In the middle, you see the IR's own search engine and down at the bottom on the left, this is the library's new discovery platform that we just brought up in June. And for the first time searchers uh, here have the ability to search across all the collections of all NOAA, uh, NOAA libraries across the agency, all of our electronic holdings and the records in the IR itself in one search. And then over on the right, you can see that all three of these search paths lead to a landing page for, and this I'm very happy to point out, is one of those NOAA Sea Grant publications. And we're thrilled now to beginning to be working with Sea Grant and we've already ingested 
10,000 of their documents into the repository and we'll continue to work with them going forward. So that older um, uh, siloed version can eventually be decommissioned at the University of Rhode Island. So you can see that we've improved quite a bit here from the earlier siloed examples in terms of findability on the, on the FAIR principle spectrum. Next slide, please. So we know that persistent identifiers help drive open science. And the reason for that is that because they create a network where we can piece together all the different parts of the research life cycle and ensure discoverability and permanence. Now the library has been minting data site DOIs for publications since 2015. And so we're very excited and I'll show you in just a minute, other possibilities to link to other parts of the research um, cycle as well. Next slide, please. And so you can see on this uh, last slide in the repository, the document on the left. Now this is a gold open access. So that's that business model from the publishers, the gold app open access article. We can include those in the IR. And over on the right, what I'm showing is more metadata that our team has created related to reuse rights as well as links to supporting files containing associated data sets. And in this case, a machine readable version of the article. So these metadata points allow us to show um, that we are supporting uh, the reusability of this particular document and uh, addressing the reuse reusability part of the FAIR principles. And this work gets us closer also to machine readability. More on this last in just a minute. Next slide, please. I'd like, I'd like to talk to some more about uh, quickly about some more integrations. So for example, this slide represents our work to get the IR and NOAA's internal manuscript review system, RPTS, which has been adopted by several line offices now, connected. Now it's not a true machine to machine integration. It relies on the author over in RPTS clicking a tab but it does deliver over to the IR side associated metadata and the research object. So this is a vast improvement to having the author having to submit manually to both systems. And we're so grateful to NIMPS for this great work. Next slide, please. And one other potential integration that we're so excited for is the fact that this year, the library joined the DOE ORCID consortium. And before I talk more about that, I mean, I, this is another just great possibility of working together with other agencies to learn best practices in open science. Now the library is funding the membership and we'll be extending this benefit to all of NOAA. We will, uh, we are, are now working on the back end of ORCID, which we can uh, get in to begin to see what's going on back there. And with a bit more infrastructure that I'll discuss in just a second, we'll soon be able to, I hope, read and write from the IR to back to ORCID and, and both ways with the ORCID records owner's permission. The use of ORCID or a, a PID for authors is also a critical requirement, as you probably remember, from the NSPM 33 guidance that came out at the end of the Trump administration that supports full discoverability and transparency on who is receiving funds from the government. Also, the new 2022 OSTP memo requires uh, full PIDs use for uh, authors and NOVA scientists. So, um, and then of course, just the more PIDs, the better for open science. Next slide, please. Last but not least, we've also begun working uh, with NIMPS to begin to build out an internal submission system that will be adjacent to the IR. Now this won't be uh, available openly, but it will enable us to build that infrastructure that we need to hold files from these other integrations, such as ORCID and data site and possibly Crossref. So we're hopefully, we're hoping very soon to be able to uh, begin to fully integrate with those systems, but we need more of this back end infrastructure um, built out. And that's what we're beginning to work. Uh, and we're funding that work with NIMS so that they can build that out for us. Next slide, please. Now I thought we were gonna be having um, Chris Markham from OSTP talk first. So 
Uh, I wasn't going to talk too much about the new 2020 OSTP memo, but since he's going to come later, I will talk a little bit about this specifically related to publications at NOAA. Um, some of the big differences that uh, we see between the 2013 memo and the 2022 memo, uh, you can see on the screen, I won't go through this line by line. One of the biggest things is the drop of that 12 month embargo from the publisher. So, under the 2013 memo, we had respected a 12 month embargo on the author's manuscript with the publishers. Uh, this is now going to go away and um, it remains to be seen, you know, what, what the, some of the reactions will be with the publishers, but we'll, we'll work through that. Also, public, what is brand new is the guidance that publications must be available in machine readable formats. And that's going to be a huge lift for us, quite frankly, but one that definitely the only way forward in open science. So I'll talk more about that before I close. And then we're also gonna to need to be more specific in our metadata about reuse rights. We're gonna to need to really be specific on, and we hope that our NOAA authors and funded authors as well, when they do publish in an open access, gold open access, and they pay that APC, they are, are being sure that they use the CC BY license and not a more restrictive license such as the CC NC or the, or the uh, non-derivative work license. That's what we like to see. And we'll continue to work also with the Office of General Counsel to see if we can make sure that we get the word out that way. Obviously, if the author submits their manuscript, their approved manuscript, or we put in a NOAA tech memo, something that does not go out on a publisher's uh, platform, those, are in, those items are in the public domain. Next slide, please. This is further information from the new OSTP memo, uh, specifically calling out a very strong requirement here to uh, imbue the use of PIDs throughout the research life cycle. Uh, and also to beef up metadata for all research products. In the new memo, there's a new section that wasn't in the 2013 memo related to scientific integrity. So a lot of the impetus about the, uh, from, on this section is about full transparency. You know, who is receiving funding? Uh, who, uh, who are the authors of, of, of uh, manuscripts and so forth? Again, I won't talk too much about this because I know we're gonna have Chris come back and talk more, but just gives you an idea of um, some of the things to be looking out for. And one of the big new things will be the requirement to assign PIDs to grants. And that's, that's gonna be a new lift. Next slide, please. So let me just close with some opportunities uh, or challenges. Um, I think our current infrastructure for open science and publications at NOAA is getting better all the time. Um, it's not gonna be a, like Shell said, there won't be a box where we can check and say we're done. We'll be constantly iterating and improving all the time. Um, one of the challenges that we do face at NOAA, I'll be quite frank, and everybody knows about our, our wonderful, wonderful decentralized culture at NOAA, but how that does translate out into uh, some um, challenges for open science is the fact that, you know, just a very concrete thing as we begin to work on the back end of ORCID, we can see all kinds of varieties and myriad ways that people have uh, offices have assigned ROARs, uh, some offices have no ROARs, and this is a perfect metadata straightening out task that the library just uh, just loves to work in. So we're busy at the moment working with both ROAR and with um, ORCID to straighten out so that we can ultimately connect up cleanly all of these uh, linkages uh, through ORCID. And then I would just want to end uh, uh, briefly just with a throw out a little bit on uh, the machine readable text. Again, a big lift for us. The, but the library just um, uh, stood up a, a digitization contract with uh, one of our vendors. We'll be digitizing 2,500 legacy print documents. That's another silo that I didn't even mention. There's still plenty of analog print out there uh, that's trapped and uh, invisible basically to us. So as we digitize that uh, next group of legacy documents, in addition to a structured PDF, we'll, we're also asking our vendor to deliver to us a full JSON um, version of that document so that we, our staff, can get used to working with that format and see what it's like 
ingesting into the IR and uh, into our, our other discovery platform. So we're really excited for those possibilities and uh, also to continue to work with all of NOAA uh, in making sure that our publications do reach those open science promises. And with that, I think that's it for me. Last slide, all right? Yes, all right. thank you so much. All right, thank you, Dee. So such a such a such a valuable and productive conversation. I think such a uh, I had a lot of opportunity to learn about it because, like you know, I definitely I came across some of the silos. For example, like a publication, especially in publication, those paywall system, right? If I wanted to read the publication letter, I mean the pub, I mean the the, uh, the research paper, then it comes to okay, you need to pay forty dollar for that. I don't have forty dollar, right? If I'm a grad student. If you are in the school, that's fine. The school has that to pay for it. But like, you know, those are sort of limitations. Not everybody has that. Does that mean that, you know, only this, this, the, the researchers who goes to the school or college are able to do that, right? So those are one of the like the things, but one thing I, it was very insightful for me, folks like who's a lot more focused on the data side, like, because when we talk about the open science, then we always think about the open data and open software, right? But a lot of time we forget about the research and publications which plays equal role, right? So it's such a great thing to hear about your perspective on that open science, right? Because just doing one component of the data as open doesn't mean we're making the whole reason, you know, the, in the opening the port of that open science. So yes, exactly, thank you. I think that's a, such a great design. I see there are so many questions uh, coming along here. So uh, we'll, we'll get to that. But we, with that, you know, we talked about now policy and now we have another speaker, uh, Joe Money. So uh, he will be talking about the path to enabling open data and open science. So uh, Joe is a NSDIS, our CTO, and uh, with the ACIO's uh, uh, office. And he has previously worked for the US Department of State internationally and domestically at Amazon Web Service in their professional service organization. So like he brings in such a uh, great breadth of uh, uh, background on the, the infrastructure side that enables open science. We talked about like, you know, to, to have the whole system, ecosystem of the open science, there are several components that need to be put together that enables open science, right? The first thing is also how we enable the infrastructure to uh, enable uh, the science, right? For example, we talked about uh, analysis ready cloud optimized uh, data formats, right? But how are we gonna do that if the, uh, in the if infrastructure is not a place? So I'll, I'll uh, lead that to the Joe to talk about some of his thoughts about. So uh, Joe said he he doesn't have a slide today, but like you know he will share his thoughts about you know uh, uh, on the path towards the open science. Uh, up to you, up to you, uh, Joe. Thank you very much, Sadir. I'm uh, glad to be here. Um, I'm going to say at the onset of this talk that I'm not a scientist. Um, I work in NESDIS. We are the environmental satellite folks. I am not even interested in the satellites. I'm not a RF engineer. I do the infrastructure. And my concern is that the scientists, the engineers, and all of our folks are satisfied with the infrastructure and they can accomplish their job. Um, I'm here to facilitate that and to make sure it's friction free. Um, today, we have a mix of legacy technical debt in the satellite world. We have on-premise systems that are antiquated and require you know, tech refreshes every three to five years. You have your laptops that are kind of old. All those things fall under my purview. Um, and what we're doing today at NESDIS is we're trying to move all of that stuff into the cloud. So why I say I don't really care about the science, it's to me, it's ones and zeros. I want you to care and I want you to be able to be successful. So I'm trying to put together systems architecture that can support all these things that you want to accomplish. Um, on premise, we're kind of limited. Um, we have very tight spaces for power, space and cooling. We have disparate data centers, disparate capabilities. So we're shifting a lot of our workloads into the cloud. Um, we're Organizing around three clouds, the NOAA uh, CIO has a BPA with SAIC, that's our vendor, and we have access to three clouds. We have access to Google, Amazon, and Microsoft clouds. Um, NESDIS has chosen to put most of our resources into Amazon's AWS cloud right now. Um, and we are currently hosting about 20 petabytes plus in Amazon's um, storage systems. That's our class archive has been migrated into Amazon. It's being used as a coop system. So we're talking about how do we enable open science? We also have an OTA going on, other transactional authority with Google. We have a high performance computing numerical weather prediction um, 
team that's researching how to use AI ML to improve the forecasts. Um, and this is directly my experience with open science. Um, I had to work across multiple line offices to get the data that Google needed to kick off the project and get their, their researchers moving. So we partnered with them, uh, Google researchers and our researchers trying to come up with these models, but they required you know, lots of data. It's not tremendous amounts, a couple of hundred terabytes, but then to find those data sets and then get them into the cloud, it, it was, it was an, an experience. Even although myself and others were NOAA employees trying to find that data and then trying to move that data into Google from on-premise, that was a that was an experience. So my big push has been, um, number one is the data, getting the data out there to be available. Um, then we have different tiers. Um, and as um, previous speakers, Shell and Dee have mentioned, you know, it's, the data's out there, it's not good enough. And what we're finding is we have a two site, two really types of users that I concentrate on. We have sophisticated users, that's yourselves, scientists, other agencies that actually know what the data is. And we have unsophisticated users. Um, our focus now is on the sophisticated users for now, just to get the data out there so they can have access to it. And what we found was the more data these researchers had access to, the better they could execute um, these, these research projects. And my number one goal is to get as much of NOAA data out there for these sophisticated users. Um, the unsophisticated users, like myself, I'm an unsophisticated user. I don't know what I want. I need some kind of robust search and um, discovery mechanisms. There's many out there that are competing for the one that everybody uses. However, um, I am such an unsophisticated user, I don't even know what I'm looking for. So uh, I think there's different levels of search that you have to uh, uh, provide for these people. Um, you have a sandbox environment. How do the scientists do research in the cloud? This falls back to the education piece that I think internally at NOAA, we have to make sure our scientists understand that the cloud is a resource. Um, and it, you have to operate in a little bit differently. Um, what you're used to on premise, we don't want to recreate in the cloud because it takes up a valuable resource and it costs a considerable amount if we continue to do the what we call the lift and shift approach. We optimize everything at Nesdis, trying to move it into the cloud um, to save funding and to make sure it runs with the least amount of labor that we can. So this is all the lessons learned from on-premise we're moving forward. So um, I think Sadir or Tyler has some other questions for me. I think I covered what that means. We're number So boil this down, distill it. I am going to get all the data I can into the cloud environment to make it available to anybody who needs to use it and enable access to that data. There's a question about IT security. We're working on that also. No, I thank you, uh, uh, Joe, for, for the perspective, right? I, I think like, you know, one of the important thing about, uh, you talk about like a data availability, right? That is important, right? Even even if the data is there, I, I, I remember for myself too, that you reminded me now that like, you know, I work with NOAA and someone came and asked me for the data and I have no clue like, you know, where to find them, right? So. So just let's imagine like, you know, if I am the person who work who in the, this domain, I couldn't find my own data, what happens to the folks who are outside the domain, they're trying to use our data sets, right? So that basically is crying for like, you know, we need to have our data sets open and accessible and searchable in a way that, you know, they can use them, right? So even like we talked about, like, you know, having the data uh, doesn't mean on the web, doesn't mean it's open, right? Because, you know, it can be in a format the way you never use, you don't know what to do with it, right? So so, the, so there will be a lot of conversation that I think we'll come back to you, Joe, on that, but I want to check if, it's only 1248, I wanted to check if Chris is able to join. Uh, uh, no, okay. I, I am here. Yeah. I am here, awesome. Sadir. Hello. Oh, that is great, Chris, what a timing. That is great. So, I, And I did. I caught the last of Joseph's comments and I thought, wow, what an interesting segue. <laughs> so so that, that, that is great. So you're, you're, you're right on time. So uh, maybe like, you know, uh, Tyler, we can uh, share the Chris screen and then I'll just probably introduce uh, uh, Chris. Again, the, uh, th thank you, Chris. So Chris, actually we had a Chris schedule in the first so that he can give a little bit uh, like a larger perspective on the open science, but he had to run in the last minute to go to the briefing into the house. So, so but thanks for coming and taking back. Just to introduce uh, Chris, like a doctor, uh, Chris uh, Stephen Martin is the assistant, uh, he's assistant director for open science and data policy in the White House uh, Office of Science and Technology Policy. So before joining OSTP, he served as one of the three NIH representative to the President, uh, President Scientific Integrity Fast Track uh, action Committee Task Force, where he co-chaired the uh, 
working group on training and transparency. Now uh, he now chairs the task force on his OSCP capacity. In addition to scientific integrity, his portfolio includes priorities that aim to uh, make federal open science more accessible, equi equitable for all Americans. So um, thank you, Chris, for taking time. I know you, you, um, you have so many things going on, but you took time and come share your uh, uh, your uh, work uh, with, uh, uh, with our NOAA colleague. We really appreciate uh, you taking time for that. So just to give you a little bit, uh, you missed maybe some talk about, like you know, Dee talked about some of the, the policies that came out from the OSTP memo, and then also uh, uh, she'll talk about some of the efforts she's been leading on the NASA tops, right? How they're trying to enable open science, right? And some of the cross, cross effort on the year of open science that we are uh, trying to, you know, we're part of that as well. So, so with that, I'll, leave it, I'll give it to you to talk about your thoughts on the open science and how you're helping in this domain. No, th thanks, thanks, Adi. Yeah, well, we'll touch on a few of those, a few of those points um, uh, again uh, in, in the talk. And I just want to thank okay. you for the introduction and uh, express a little bit of gratitude to Noah for the invitation to provide uh, some some thoughts on, and to be part of this panel with my so many of my colleagues uh, from the subcommittee of open science. Uh, it's, it's great to see everybody here. Um, today, I, I'll talk a little bit about our uh, transformative opportunities for open data and open data policy uh, guidance that OCP is working on. Um, and in addition to, as Sudhir said, in addition to open science data policy, I help lead scientific integrity and data security portfolios at OSTP. Both of those topics intersect very, uh, very tightly with open data. Uh, and, and for the talk today, I just want to be clear uh, for, for two, on point, two points. First, some of you may have seen some of these some of these points, talking points um, and slides before at other, other presentations. Uh, I will have some new things to, to talk about, um, but also that our focus here is really on digital data, not physical samples, not lab notes, ethnographic materials. Though certainly we think that those scientific products are worth highlighting in other conversations in terms of open science. Open scholarship is a new term that I, I recently uh, have started to, to adopt uh, uh, as well. And thanks to uh, Greg Tenenbaum and the Open Research Funders Group. Um, I'll begin by setting the stage on two related concepts in the panel that uh, we'll discuss greater. Um, first is open data. Uh, and, and, and I think we, we probably heard um, while I was out uh, on that, but, uh, but really I want to talk about the uh, princi FAIR principles. Um, and Sudhir has asked me to provide some, um, some points on these and to cover a few uh, of what the opportunities are in achieving sort of the ideals of FAIR data. Um, Making access to, federally, uh, to federal data has been a key part of the Biden-Harris administration's efforts to improve transparency and equity in government science. And you've probably most recently seen this uh, articulated um, uh, during his, his Cancer Moonshot talk uh, this last week up in Boston. Um, next slide, please. So in, in the reason so we're here today is talk about open data and, and recognizing that there are multiple definitions in the community in the simplest terms, let's, let's, let's get to first principles, we can consider data to be open when anybody can freely access, use, and share it. Okay, but if we start with that sort of basic um, principle. It's important to note though, that, that open data is really an ideal for scientific discovery, translation, and collaboration. And it, it's really from a policy perspective, we need to recognize that not all scientific and research data can be open under the broadest possible terms. It's not all can fit into that ideal per se. There are limitations um, to some data with respect to considerations of privacy, um, propriety, culture, uh, and security that preclude complete openness. And I think probably Shell had that nice, uh, if, I, if, I, if I know the slides well, she probably had a nice uh, uh, spectrum of open science um, and, and, and data is no, of no exception. Um, that's to say, for the most part, even scientific data falls on that continuum from completely closed to completely open. And they're not, it's not a discrete thing. It's not open or closed per se. Next slide, please. Of course, even uh, when the ideal state of open data is achieved, open data are relatively ineffective, uh, as we just heard uh, from our colleague in the previous presentation, as a tool for investigation, when they cannot be easily be found or accessed by uh, would-be users. For this reason, open science community uh, and the movement in general has more or less coalesced around the FAIR principles of scientific data, most famously articulated by Wilkinson and colleagues in the 2016 Nature article, that open data should be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. I think that th th some of the other panels had a lot to say about this, um, and, and that's, that's great. But I would say the relative success, um, there's been relative success in the community 
um, here on, on, uh, on uh, uh, findability and accessibility. And we really have had some challenges on interoperability and reusability of open data. And so maybe we can talk a little bit about that. And, and there are at least three high level reasons for valuing interoperability and reusability of data. These can broadly characterize as trustworthiness, acceleration and equity. First, science needs to be re re replicable in order to be trustworthy. Some disciplines have seen you know, recent attention drawn to the challenges of replic 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 excuse me, replication uh, in their fields and the reusability of data is a primary mechanism that supports the replication of results. Second, interoperability accelerates discovery and translation for both academic and business users of data. Barriers to both intra and interdisciplinary are reduced when those data systems can communicate with one another. And we put these together, interoperability and reusability of data allow for the data to be combined in new ways to inform and update old results and findings that sort of drive the leading edge of discovery. Further, um, interoperability and reusability support equity in science. This is particularly salient for federally funded data and is a priority of the administration. And ensuring that data can be reused um, reduces unnecessary duplication, which is not the same thing as, as the, what is necessary for replication. Uh, it provides the ability for new sets of eyes to examine data and, interoperate, and the interoperation helps to more evenly distribute data sets okay, across what is a highly unevenly funded interdisciplinary landscape across the scientific disciplines. So reusability and interoperability enhance the findability and accessibility components of the of FAIR, and they make science more inclusive and more equitable. Next slide, please. There are real opportunities for policy and practice to innovate towards transforming open data towards the FAIR principles. Here, I'll, I'm just going to point out three, um, three such opportunities in, in sort of transformative opportunities that we're involved with, um, including uh, uh, research silos, infrastructure needs, and guidance standards. First of all, we recognize that research silos contribute to barriers to data sharing broadly. Uh, this, in some of, the, some of the great work on the NSTC Subcommittee of Open Science, uh, has has demonstrated um, uh, in our conversations and our engagement with others, um, and Dee and, and, and Shell and, and Sudhir um, will know, that this includes by lowering the appetite for interoperability and reusability of data. Okay, so when silos sort of make it harder. Um, many take the approach that these silos need to be broken down. However, we have a different approach. Those same silos exist because of their successes in science. Um, and so rather than break them down, there's a real opportunity for policymakers and funders to incentivize opening up those silos and bridging across the established labs. Part of that incentive is by lowering barriers to collaboration by making the data interoperable um, in general. Naturally, those efforts require infrastructure, both technical and human resource infrastructure. Excellent, uh, you know, excellent infrastructure exists. Um, you know, we've got storage uh, capacity um, um, and innovations and translators, APIs, common data models. They're all available on the market today, okay? They should be considered for how they can be adapted to make data more interoperable and reusable and, and industry and uh, the federal agencies um, are, are doing just that, um, thankfully. Uh, on the policy and practice side, we, we recognize that closed source proprietary data collection, curation and storage systems it may impede interoperability, and we consider how that might be a barrier to achieving fair, fair data principles in general. Moreover, um, investments in interoperability and reusability infrastructure should consider the life force of the scientific enterprise. Training emerging users is important, and, but so is, and so is training and retraining the established users. Labs that have traditionally used the silo model can be resourced to develop interoperability and reusability plans that their incoming cohorts of fellows and early career individuals can deploy. Support for retooling established labs is an important uh, opportunity to consider, and we may provide for innovation in shaping the incentives for investigators and institutions to make data more open in this way. Of course, that solid infrastructure is only as good as the standards supporting the actual implementation of that. Um, so, you know, uniform data models, open standards, and guidances should be amenable to as new technologies and research paradigms come online and the, the discourse moves forward and changes. We want to realize a future where open data is entirely fair, 
But in order to do that, we have to have the standards that necessarily need, are, are dynamic in nature. Recently, uh, NSTC Subcommittee on Open Science um, that I've been mentioning, we uh, released guidance that had been developed over a number of years um, called um, a, a, a Guidance for Desirable Characteristics Data Repositories for Federally Funded Research. And the guidance concludes with about what I think is a pretty strong statement that is intended to be a living document and it's revisable with that, for, that dynamic future in mind. Finally, there's an opportunity for thought leadership and innovation and in how one aspect of, of data fairness may spill over into another. For example, making data more interoperable may improve its accessibility and reusability simply by the virtue that it can by definition be linked to other open data sets. Next slide, please. Um, and of course, transformation is, is really uh, already underway here. Many federal agencies that conduct or fund science are already engaged in policy and practice efforts to transform towards open and fair data. Here, uh, I'll highlight just a few of those across government. Um, first, I think uh, it, as Dee has, has, has previously previewed for you, um, making federally funded research data available to the public for free is a primary feature of the uh, uh, new policy guidance that came out of OSTP on public access. Data supporting the research results of peer-reviewed publications should be uh, deposited in an agency designated repository that aligns with the desirable characteristics that I just mentioned. And all of the data eventually should be deposited in a, uh, likewise in a reasonable timeline. Some agencies are already well on their way to accomplishing that goal with, with the research communities. For instance, in January of this upcoming year, uh, the NIH, National Institutes of Health, will have the data management and sharing policy go into effect and will require for the first time that investigators have plans to share their NIH-funded data um, with the public, uh, barring, of course, individual privacy and other limitations, um, but that that data is to be shared as openly and as fairly as possible. Second, uh, National Science Foundation recently announced awardees of their FAROS program, and this is uh, this will fund research coordination networks aimed at catalyzing the scientific community around innovative strategies to make research products, including open data, more fair across the whole uh, ecosystem. Here at NOAA, uh, there, are, there are lots of initiatives to increase the fairness of data, um, such as of course, NOAA public, uh, plan for public access to research, PAR, uh, that probably Dee had, had, had talked about, um, includes uh, provisions for NOAA-funded data to conform to the FAIR principles. And the new, uh, new-ish, I'd say, NOAA data, uh, open data strategy, which focuses on six transformative advance, in, advancements, um, including uh, uncrewed systems, AI, uh, cloud computing, and uh, and I, what I find, as someone who's coming from a human genome, pretty exciting, uh, 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 the advanced use of um, cloud computing to analyze DNA, RNA, and other proteins, small molecules. It's pretty exciting. Uh, the sort of omics, uh, if you will, of data. And then, of course, um, citizen science uh, uh, and community-based participatory research. More specifically, uh, in some of the initiatives that OSTP has, um, has been involved with uh, recently, um, include the integrated ocean observing system for open data sharing. Um, so, so within within IOS, uh, the, there's provisions for data sharing regions that they have to maintain data access consistent with the FAIR principles that's explicitly stated in the policy. Um, and then, of course, data access is only sort of part of that story. NOAA is also making headway to improve the interpretation and usability of data through interpretive tools that anyone can use and reuse, just for the general public. One really great example of that is the National Integrated Heat Health Information System or, um, that you can find on heat.gov. Um, this is multi-agency collaboration um, to deliver up-to-date information on communities affected by extreme heat through, throughout the nation. The system combines data from NOAA, HHS, EPA, and the Forest Service, uh, wait, Forest Service, FEMA, and I'm missing one, VA, also the VA, um, into useful information and graphics that are really easy for anyone um, to, to understand. At OSTP, we're looking forward to continued coordination across federal agencies through the National Science and Technology Council of Community Open Science with priorities like heat.gov that synergize open data resources across government. And through these collaborations, we want to deliver life-saving and quality promoting information to the American public. And that's, uh, that's where the, the new public access policy and our continued coordination. Oh. coordination efforts. Um, slides here. Thank you.
Well, uh, oh, there, there it is. Well, that, that's all I have. Um, and uh, I, I want to thank, thank everybody here for their time. I, I know we're looking forward to the, to, to the Q&A, so I'll stop. Thanks again. All right. No, thank you, Chris. I, I think uh, it's really valuable to hear your perspective on what's happening in the, across the federal government, right? Their uh, effort on open science that's, that's, uh, that's happening. So definitely saw the new memo came out, we're excited about, but you know, so definitely we wanted to, uh, we'll have some discussion around that as well. There are so many uh, really uh, good questions around here in the, in the chat as well. So we're trying to digest to see like, you know, which one we can actually add in. If we're, if we're not able to respond to all, bring in all this question because of the time limitation that we have, we'll make sure those questions are answered uh, in, in, uh, in the document we'll share with. So I think like, you know, I'll, I'll pass it to Tyler for she has a, you know, one question from the, she wanted to uh, pose uh, from, the, uh, from the group. Great, thank you, Sudhir. Um, I'd like to, um, to invite all the panelists to turn their cameras back on if you haven't already. Um, and we'll, um, we'll have a, a Q and A and hopefully a lively discussion. Um, so I wanted to, to start with, um, with a question. Um, I saw um, a, uh, a tough question from Kathy Smith in the um, in the chat that got me thinking about um, incentives um, for um, for open science and um, and then um, the um, the statement by Stell that said um, that the one of the ideas of open science is to make the gatekeepers irrelevant. Um, but the sad truth is that the gatekeepers have power, right? And that's why they're the gatekeepers. Um, and um, so I was curious if we could. Um, it, hear from the panelists about your ideas of um, combining training and retraining, as Chris just said, um, in, uh, in the principles and benefits of open science, and how that, how that can combine with uh, mandates like, um, like the new PAR uh, requirements to affect culture change and to change the incentives um, for how, um, how success in science is, uh, is perceived and rewarded. Tyler, if it's okay, I'll hop in because I was looking at, it's Kathy, I just saw C. Smith in the chat, that, uh, that one of their comments was that uh, about scientists being judged uh, by peer-reviewed publications and ability to get grants and lead programs, and there's this inherent tension between how competitive science really is, and it comes down to funding and career, and it's it's a difficult uh, topic, I think, to navigate because many people see open science as an additional mandate. It's more work to do that's not necessarily funded. And uh, I think she points out also like, you know, there's the time and luxury to spend to work on open science, to make your practices open. And I think that part of what we're trying to socialize here is that it is more work but it is also part of your job. And it actually really makes your science more impactful. There are many, many studies now that if you follow these open science principles, not only is your science more impactful, but it's more inclusive, it has more applications. So spending time on that is actually part of spending time on ensuring that the science that you do has the broadest impact possible. And that actually acts, it feeds back to act as an incentive on your career. So if you write papers that get more publications, which open science papers get more citations, then your H index increases and your career takes off. If more people are talking about your research because you're doing it openly and they're engaging in it, you're more likely to get collaborators and new funding opportunities. So I don't think it's an one thing or the other. I think actually you can be really, okay, Full disclosure, I'm probably the, one of the most competitive scientists that I know, and I embrace the open science, and uh, I don't think that they're at odds to each other. I think they complement each other. Could, could I add a, a couple of, of sort of um, OSTP level talking points on, the, on that specific thing as well? So, right? so uh, a couple, couple of things on here. So, so first, um, Everyone on this panel should be aware that um, National Academies actually has, an, has a work uh, roundtable on incentives uh, for, for open science and, and that I would direct you all to sort of take a close look at that working groups outputs. 
Um, they're sort of building a toolkit for, for incentives that we know um, how hard it is uh, as particularly early stage career and invest, uh, investigators um, that are working on their tenure packages for the universities to be faced with a system that does not incentivize anything except for publications um, and, and grants. Um, and so, and so we, we do want to work to change that culture. Um, there, is, there are some very new, as of immediately after the OSTP uh, uh, memo came out, um, some new um, um, uh, developments in this space. Uh, on the international front. And so the um, uh, Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft, the, the, the German uh, NSF equivalent, immediately, almost immediately, released their guidance that now incentivizes um, out other research outputs with equal par um, for, um, for publications. And so, uh, so if you produce open software, if you produce an open data set and you have a DOI, you deposit it and you do the right, you do the work, okay? And as Shell says, I wouldn't say it's Hard, I would say it's more work. It's just the same amount of work that you're going to be doing normally if you're going to be curating your data sets for your own use. You're just now making it available. Um, then you will get credit for that um, from in their funding piece. We at OSTP can help incentivize that by by you know by yeah, convening the interagency to to examine those possibilities, to look at those incentives, and to help shift that culture. Because it would make a lot, whole lot of sense, for example, that if, if the NIH and the NSF and their grant and and, and, and other funding agencies um, 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 included not just your your top five publications, whatever, but say what are your top five contributions uh, and how are they impactful? So, over. All right, thank you, Chris. Uh, there are thoughts from the other palace, D Joe. Just one quick thought, uh, sort of a piggy piggyback to what Chris just said. Uh, the library uh, does a lot of bibliometrics work for uh, lab reviews, program reviews, even uh, individual researcher impact reports. And one of the things that we like to try to encourage people is to think beyond the H index and to, we can do other work such as uh, network analysis to see who is the most collaborative how many, how many collaborators does this, uh, has this person worked with? Has this, has this scientist worked interna uh, with international collaborators? And these are other ways to showcase value that go beyond the H index. I would also be, you know, hopefully we can start thinking, talking about, uh, I think Tyler mentioned gatekeepers. Um, the journals are gatekeepers, okay? So we, I, I think we should think, first of all, uh, be very mindful of metrics related to journals, such as the journal impact factor, and be very mindful about uh, when and how we're using that. Uh, it's, it's received quite a lot of criticism, but yet we hear people, you know, refer to it. Um, so that's just my two bits for now. Thank you. All right, thank you. So, <clears throat> I think like, you know, in the, there are several questions that, that I see Tyler here, but now I, I was curious, actually, I wanted to expand a little bit on the, the current OSTP guidance, uh, especially like, you know, looking at the, uh, that came out, like in the role of current OSTP guidance to make federally funded research freely available by 2025 to enable open science, right? 2025 is not very far away from where we are right now. So I wanted to ask, like, you know, what are the challenges and the opportunities that we see? Because I know there will be challenges, but that's also I see as an opportunity is there for us, right? Any current efforts that panel can share from the, what's going on around to give us some exposure at that level? Uh, I'll probably start with Chris or Dee. Sure, I mean, ch challenges and opportunities for, for this. I mean, so I think, well, I mean, I think the, one of the, it, it really depends on on the state of the public access policies at the existing agencies. For first of all, um, because there are some that are uh, that are further along than than others. Um, I think Noah's in great shape. Dee's done an excellent job. We've had some email exchange on that, and, and it looks like Noah's in great great shape there. Um, there are other agencies that are um, need, need a lot of help, and so I think one of the challenges is interagency coordination uh, and to make sure that 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 the interagency is really getting. Um, providing uh, providing opportunities for 
uh, for feedback on policies and 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 alignment, um, and to learn from the sort of rich history all going back into the mid two thousands on 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 this. Um, another challenge, of course, is going to be um, uh, faced with the constituent gatekeeper that Dee just mentioned, uh, the, the publishers, um, and this includes small scholarly pub publishers, but also large for-profit publishers, you know, they resist any shock, right, any shock to, the, to the, and they would consider the zero embargo policy a shock to, to, the, to the economy, um, uh, to, to, the, to the marketplace, and, and, that's, and that's a fair criticism. Um, and uh, and so we have to be prepared to to, to help assist with innovative um, you know innovation in that that way. Opportunities, you know, we look at challenges as opportunities, right? And so in both those cases, uh, OSTP is uh, going to continue to um, to really lean in on the interagency coordination uh, aspect through the SOS. Um, a number of you are I see a number of familiar names uh, in the panel, and that's that's great. Um, uh, uh, but also with with engagement, we've already, in, um, I mean, we've been engaging with publishers now for the, the last 10, 10 years and over the last two administrations have, has been um, ramped up quite a bit because I think this was on the horizon for a long time. Um, and, uh, but what we think would be really fantastic as an opportunity is to, is to really hope to really convene um, to make sure the stakes are held out to help foster innovative business models to help foster uh, innovative sharing models, make things easier for researchers and open science will be easier. Uh, like it won't be more work. It might be less work. The, the, the use of, if everyone adopts the use of persistent digital identifiers across their research portfolios, they no longer have to go track down that paper that, that, that Noah is knocking on your door and saying, hey, this was federally funded, where is it? And they're like, I don't know. It's, it, it, but, you know, so we want to make, we want to lower those barriers and that's an opportunity. Um, I think probably Shell and D probably have some things to say about that too. I'll let D go first. Do you have comments, D? No, I mean, I, 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 my thoughts are pretty much in line with, you know, what Chris is, has already said. Um, I, I do have, you know, the journals, um, are, uh, they are what they are, you know, they are a critical part of our infrastructure, uh, the publishers are. And uh, we do, uh, we are concerned that when the, um, the open access uh, business models, uh, whether they be gold, green, bronze, um, that we're not, we're shifting, we're, op we're opening up, uh, the gold open access, for example, is opening up access on the, on the end user. Okay, so which is wonderful and, and awesome. It is also creating barriers at the beginning. <laughs> you know, uh, there was a very good piece that just came out in science this week about um, the who does gold open access work for and who it doesn't. It works for people who are well funded, who are older, who are very well established, and, you know, maybe, you know, uh, majority uh, white. Um, scientists. And uh, so when everybody has to pay, you know, $3,000, $4,000, $11,000 uh, for an APC in a journal, who is, who can afford uh, to publish? So that's something we have to, I, I don't know the answer to that. I think it's something, um, you know, that we need to be very mindful of. Um, uh, it's wonderful that we're opening up on the other end so that every can, everyone can read. You know, that's, that's fantastic. Yeah, I would say, uh, Andy, that, that um, one of the great things that we learned in that article at AAAS, uh, from, is that the AAAS journals will not, uh, in fact, use that model. And that is a fantastic news to read. Uh, they will continue to, their subscription-based model. And for federally funded research, they will have um, what, in, of course, is known as a green model, where, where um, uh, researchers can conform to the um, policy guidance by providing uh, a, a manuscript. Um, so, uh, and we think that there's other great ways to incentivize the journals to, to continue to provide the great service, because you're right, they're a critical part of the infrastructure. Um, 
are they the only way to achieve what we need for high, you know, highly scientific, integral, peer-reviewed research? They are not. We have other models available. And new models are emerging. The the, the pre-peer review models emerging. We have um, we have the society-based peer review models, which has sort of been forgotten about in part because of the status of the high impact journals, but um, but it is it is the way that peer review used to be. <laughs> and so that is another um, a, a, another as aspect that we should be thinking about. The other is, uh, I'd say that I, I believe that um, Howard Hughes uh, is convening um, a, a, a meeting at the end of the year on uh, on preprint and, but specifically on the peer review uh, um, uh, process that scholarly societies can help. All right, good. Thank you, Chow. Yeah, I just want to comment because there's been a discussion going on in the chat also on this peer review aspect that's going on with journals. And, you know, peer review has demonstrated biases. So it's it's not also, it's part of the equity about publications is who can afford to publish in these open access journals. But part of it also is how is peer review working or not working for underrepresented communities? And it turns out that if you're from a high profile institution, you have a much, much higher probability of getting through peer review than if you're from a lower profile institution. And I haven't seen the evidence, but my guess is that that maps onto underrepresented groups as well. So open, I, I think that there are some solutions that have been proposed to try and increase and address some of these problems. But this is again, like open science is complicated and it's messy and we're figuring this out. And I think we need to acknowledge that. And we need to acknowledge that as the discussions earlier, it's not just federal agencies, it's not just data providers or universities, it's everyone. We need this entire ecosystem to lean into trying to fix what is a little bit of a broken process right now. Um, so uh, I was going to um, take another uh, really excellent question from the chat here. Um, Laura Branskella asked, um, how do you reconcile the push towards open science with rules that are in place for federal agencies, especially regarding IT? Um, so. Joe, I would love for you to uh, to jump in and take a first stab at that, and then we can maybe hear from other panelists. Sure. So there's two types of risk. There's a perceived risk and an actual risk. I think a lot of people are acting on the perceived risks and how scared they are about letting access. Um, there are many methods to grant access to different uh, tiers of user. Um, it's just uh, you have to communicate that appropriately to the ISSO, the security organization, to the authorizing officials. Uh, you have to come up with a good plan. It is doable. There's no restrict. There's no, absolutely not. Um, I understand that there are some data sets that are restricted for uh, reason, various reasons. Some of ours are artificially held back because, you know, four hour delay on some of our data. But um, to give it out to people and, you know, the IT security rules are interpreted differently. They are guidance and you just have to have a firm but um, savvy person who's giving you top cover to make these things happen and they can be done. It's just you have to apply the pressure to some of the inertia within the organization and continuously apply that pressure to get your, uh, get your needs met. It can be done. Any thoughts from the other panelists on that issue? I would just say that I, I, we, the infrastructure challenges sometimes are uh, sometimes sometimes Joseph can can we can use that top cover to to um, to overcome. Sometimes they're they're built right into the to in, they're, sometimes they're built right into the very um, nature of the organization and and uh, and so um, and so it can be a little bit more challenging. Um, I, I would say that that your your point about perceived, you know, moving from the perceived risk perspective or, or being motivated by the perceived risk is, is correct. And in fact, there was a couple of, there are a couple of studies looking at 
uh, consent language for clinical trial data and, and how it was, we're basically over predicting that we're going far beyond what is required of the Privacy Act, far beyond what is required of HIPAA. And, um, and, and that is out of a preponderance of perceived risk that is not, there's not a lot of evidence um, that supports it. So I think that being very, another way is, is to convene experts in data security, data privacy and, and infrastructure that understand that exact point about the perceived, uh, the difference between perceived and actual risk and not where, where our hearts are. Our hearts, we don't, we want, we want, you know, to be secure, we want to be protective, but often our hearts are misaligned with the reality of the world. Right, thank you. Anyone else? All right, so, yeah, I think we're almost like a five minutes to our time. Uh, so, so what we'll try to do, so I, I actually, I have one question like moving forward for the larger uh, group here, especially like in our, uh, the, guests from the outside agencies and and also you know, through Chris as well like you know uh, shell you talked about like what are there are a lot of opportunities going on in the NASA tops right there is opportunity thanks for sharing those links definitely we'll share a large across NOAA as well for everyone uh, but I also want to sort of understand like here and share with our you NOAA folks here like you know what are the path forward for NOAA collaboration in these larger US government open science initi initiatives right there are several initiatives happening. I'd like to hear a little bit more, you know, if you'd like to add uh, Chris Rochelle about like, you know, the, the 2023 year of open science effort, what's going on around that. And also what steps as a, as, as, as a NOAA we could uh, take to start, uh, start to take towards, the, towards the, that collaboration and who should we be involved with? You know, if there are any, anything that you would like to share with the, uh, with the group, that would be very helpful. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we are working completely in the open. I just put a link to the GitHub site uh, that has discussions enabled. So we, in all of our panels and forums, we encourage people to like post questions there so that it's not just the people at the panel and forum who can discuss these answers because it's open to the entire scientific community. And we often, I think we have close to 800 people on our email list now and people actively participate in those discussions. So that's another place to participate in open science discussions. I just wanted to highlight that quickly first. And for the year of open science on that GitHub is where we're starting to organize a lot of resources so that if you wanted to uh, teach open core at NOAA, if you wanted to do the certification process at NOAA, that will all those resources will be available. And we don't just wanna be providing them, we actually wanna be co-developing with them. So if NOAA was you know, willing to work with us to develop events and activities for NOAA employees and scientists and contractors and uh, people who are funded by NOAA, we would really welcome that engagement. Thank you. Now we'll definitely take note of that and probably coordinate across the and share with the NOAA. Now, thank you for sharing that opportunity. And, and Chris, uh, your thoughts, if you wanted to share. No, I mean, I, I think uh, uh, Michelle's completely right. I mean, you know, it's kind of challenging. The irony about being uh, in a position where I'm promoting open science um, across the, the federal agency is that the infrastructure, again, relates to Joseph's thing that we're given is is uh, necessarily closed, but by people above uh, the office of OST, uh, OSTP, and so, um, and so we are we're stuck with the uh, many of you on here. Um, we're stuck with Max uh, right now, um, uh, but I would say that opportunities for NOAA to be involved um, on uh, in really any aspect of of the uh, of the work that the subcommittee on open science is doing are. Are, are myriad. Um, you know, we we have um, we have worked uh, sub subgroups on Year of Open Science in 2023, where we're going to be um, trying to uh, coordinate across um, uh, lots of lots of uh, uh, programs and opportunities from the agencies. Um, but there's also an infrastructure working group. There's data security um, working group. There's publications working group on Diazon and and uh, and uh, those working, you, you do not have to be nominated by your agencies um, to, 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 to join those, those working groups, those subgroups. You can, um, you know, with your supervisor's approval, join and, and participate very actively and, and engage. We, you know, we see NOAA as a leader in, 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 uh, in, in producing 
um, uh, data and, and pubs. And so this is a great opportunity for everybody. And we encourage you to, to please, you can email me directly. You can actually, you can also email Sudhir and, and Dee and they can, they can uh, put you in contact with us um, uh, through that group. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, you, Shell, Sudhir, D, it's fun, right? I mean, <laughs> it's like the best part of my job. It's like, <laughs> I mean, we have a good time and we, we're really trying to, um, really trying to put together infrastructure in, in a really challenging way, right? Because each agency is so different and there are some agencies that are really noisy about what they want. Uh, and I think our job in OSTP is to try to moderate that noise to make sure that all the equities across um, you know, uh, the government are, are heard. Um, so please reach out if you're interested because we-, we Thank you. Uh, thank you everyone. So I think we're right on time at 1.30 that we need to wrap up, but I definitely, what I would like to do is I'd like to thank all our uh, presenters and panelists for taking time to come and share their work. I think this is just the start, I will say, right? Because we would like to move forward with this, the information definitely will, what we'll do is, We'll collect all the questions that we have here and try to answer them if we are not able to answer them here. And we'll also share all the resources into this, the doc that we'll be sending out to all the NOAA, uh, folks around NOAA as well. So again, thank you uh, all for coming and taking me share and also the audience for taking time to uh, hear us. And then definitely open science is, in the, is something like, you know, not one uh, agency can do. This is some sort of like a uh, collaborative effort. That's where I see. So there's a lot of opportunities for us. So with that, uh, Scott, Tyler, if you want to say anything. Um, Paul was going to close us out with a few logistical announcements. Okay. All right, Paul. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Sudhir. Thanks, Tyler. Um, Thank you, everyone. Uh, at the bottom of this session's page on Sketch is space to provide any sort of comment or feedback you may have for us. Uh, we would greatly appreciate any feedback you have on this session. Um, after this is the closing plenary, starting at 145 Eastern, uh, the closing keynote will feature Mary Erickson and Carrie Sheets from the National Weather Service. And the next set of workshop sessions will begin at 3.30 Eastern. So take advantage of the breaks and uh, step away from the computer and come back refreshed. Thanks, everyone. All right, thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you.